The transcript? Yeah. Is it too much? Is it too much? Do you want me to pass your slides? Yeah, it's too much. Yeah, but you can put the text. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for, for joining in this workshop. We have a very small room, but then uh, we are also able to have a more, more cozy discussion. Um, <laughs> uh, my name is Marta Capello. I'm from Etno. I'm from the uh, European Telecom Network Operators Association. I will be co-moderating co this session with my colleague Carlos Afonso from Brazil, who is uh, going to introduce himself in a minute. We also have our online moderator, our colleague uh, Christina Holausen. Um, very briefly on, on this topic, uh, we, are, we are here bringing 5G, IoT, uh, AI, um, and how with these new technologies we can address digital inclusion and, and accessibility. We know this is a really, really broad topic that you have always, already been discussing in other, in other issues. Um, 
Um, but we, what, what we really would like uh, to, um, to steer the discussion here for, to see whether these technologies can actually help us um, to, to bridge the gap, uh, to, to, to bridge the divide, uh, uh, or, or, or uh, what are the risks of accentuating the, the, the differences in, in society. Um, we have a lot of opportunities. We think this should be embraced, but we also have a lot of risks. I'm not going to be very long in this introduction. I just want to highlight that we have, uh, are very privileged to have a very diverse panel of speakers of all of the stakeholder groups and, and regions. Um, and uh, we, we hope to actually have short interventions so that you can engage. So I would really appreciate if you could take your notes uh, on, the, on the first half an hour of interventions and really, really ask questions and bring your points of view to the table. Um, and I think it's all from my side, Carlos Afonso. So hello there, good morning. Uh, I'm Carlos Afonso, I'm director for, from the Institute of Technology and Society, ITS Rio, from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Uh, it's our pleasure uh, to be part of this, uh, this panel. Uh, as you can imagine, this panel is the result of a merge uh, of two different uh, workshop proposals, and uh, we want to make this uh, as an experiment of uh, serendipity, in which uh, I think this merge can provide us with a very interesting opportunity for us to look uh, at the issue of uh, new technologies or new ICTs <coughs> through the lens of uh, inclusion and accessibility. Uh, as, as Marta has said, it, we have uh, quite a challenging task ahead of us since we are dealing with 5, 5G, IoT, and AI. But I think it's going to be really interesting to see what are the challenges and what are the obstacles uh, on those different technologies concerning uh, accessibility and inclusion. From my side, just to say that it's a, it's a pleasure to co-host this, uh, this workshop. Uh, ITS is currently uh, spearheading the Secretariat of the Global Network uh, of Internet and Society Research Centers, which is a network uh, that encompasses more than 80 centers uh, dedicated to do research on uh, different fields on internet and, and society. And AI, it's one of our um, most important topics to, to research right now. So we are really uh, happy to be able to share with you some of our current research and, and some of the members of the NOC uh, are here to, to share their expertise on those topics. So let's make sure we have an engaging uh, conversation. Just for a very um, uh, quick uh, housekeeping, our speakers are going to be kept short on five-ish uh, minute presentation, but uh, I'll, I'll hand over to, 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 to Marta so that we can uh, begin the first, the first round of uh, presentations that we have for this uh, session. So Marta, if you want to continue. Thank you very much, uh, Carlos, uh, for, for those uh, remarks. So um, we um, will start with the accessibility angle, and then we go to more to the AI angle. So I would ask uh, Alexia gonzalez Fanfaloni, an economist and telecoms policy an analyst at the Digital Economy Policy of OECD, um, that is going to give, you, uh, to give us a, an introduction on what are the main issues and opportunities that 5G can bring to accessibility. Thank you, Alexia. Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor for the OECD to be here and talk about this uh, topic. I must say that there's a lot of hype around 5G networks, so I'm going to try to to be as a, the realist in the room and say what are the implications really for network deployment and um, what are the experience of our OECD countries to date and in, in, in where this might be going. So that's why the title of the presentation is The Road to 5G. Um, because we're still in no progress and we hope that there will be more developments in the upcoming two years. Next slide, please. So what is the promise of 5G? Um, the IMT 2020 usage scenarios that were set by the ITU um, has two main, three main uh, usage case scenarios. Enhanced mobile broadband, the ultra reliable and low latency ap applications, so this is like critical IoT applications, and massive machine type of, of M2M, which is more like sensors and different type of IoT. 
So what is different from this new generation of, of wireless networks? This is a, an evolution from 3G, 4G, now 5G. But what is different is it's the first standard to be conceived with IoT world in mind, where millions of connected devices will be um, ha handling different network requirements and an exponential increase in data that we will see in the years to come. Next slide, please. But what are the implications of this? So um, I'm a telecom specialist, so I'll just talk about what, how networks work today. You can see the <coughs> macro cell in, in the top uh, left. This is how 4G and, 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 and networks have been deployed up to date. 5G will also use macro cells, but there's a, a new uh, trend that we've seen. Although the, the standard, uh, the, non, the standalone standard still has to go through the second phase. The first phase was completed in June 2018. Um, we do know that one trend that, that many of the initial deployments and trials is smaller cells. So when you see down there the, the, the <coughs> cell site in a lamppost, that's a Verizon network in Boston. And if the lampposts are the new cell tower, this means that we need much more fiber backhole deployment. Because as we have been saying for many years in the OECD, wireless networks are, are an extension of fixed networks. So fixed infrastructure, and this is important for many emerging economies, fixed infrastructure has to be deployed deeper into the networks to have lower latency and better quality communications. So when we talk about digital divides, we have to think that it's not only access to basic internet, it's access to high quality internet that will provide firms with the productivity enhancements that they need in order to compete in, in this global economy. So in the uh, right hand side, there's other type of technologies, for example, P-cells, this is a, a company Artemis. What we thought was interesting is these are fiber cables in the, in the posts and they create personal cells. So it's more like wireless and fixed become more similar. <laughs> We don't really know where, where, where it goes. Companies like Verizon in the, U, in the US saying that they'll be deploying in the next three years 36 million miles of fiber in order to have a functional 5G network. This, this is significant investment and it might shift the competition between fixed and wireless carriers in many countries, which makes us regulators, because our constituents and our working party as the regulators of the OECD, to put ourselves in our feet to what, what are the challenges in order to tackle this, to foster incentives, to keep on deploying networks, but also to have pro-competitive regulation so we have a level playing field. Next slide, please. What, so what does this demand? This, what, what is it, this network densification that we keep hearing in the news? So more fiber back hole needed for 5G. <laughs> There will be new demands of wireless infrastructure, notably new IoT applications. For example, um, Intel has, has come up with this number that one automated vehicle, fully automated vehicle, in one day will produce 4,000 gigabits of data. Just to put this number in perspective, this is equivalent today at the average mobile user in the OECD, 50,000 users, okay? So what does this mean? This means Network infrastructure has to be upgraded. There will be high demand on, on telecom operators, on regulators, on policymakers to make this reality. And some countries are forging ahead, and in some regions, rural and urban, well, there will be some gaps. So we have to think about this. Next slide, please. This is the gigabyte per month to today in, in uh, OECD countries, the consumption for mobile broadband description. So as you remember the first slide, I, I had uh, the first usage case scenario for 5G is enhanced mobile broadband, but that's not the only usage case. We've seen in, in the top OECD countries in gigabyte consumption, there's a trend of uh, an exponential increase of this in, over the years. Next slide, please. So what will be needed, as I mentioned, more fiber backbone and backhaul. This is the percentage of fiber subscription in OECD. Some countries like Korea and Sweden are <coughs> high ahead, but other countries that mention 4.0, industry 4.0 and the industrial revolution as important, such as Germany, are in the lowest fiber um, deployment in, in the OECD. So uh, this not to mention that fiber is the only option. There's many next generation access technologies, but there will be an increased uh, demand for investment in networks, and we hope that, that we can work together in order to make this a reality. So 
this report, next slide, um, also mentions, can't talk about wireless without mentioning spectrum. One of the um, new uses of, of spectrum that will come about with 5G is millimeter wave spectrum with very high um, um, frequency and in 26 gigahertz. That's why we will also need smaller cells because this type of spectrum requires smaller cells. But there's other fre frequency bands that have be, I mean, talked about in the middle, the 3.5 and lower bounds are more good for coverage and 700 megahertz. The, the report that will be published in January that I've been working on w talks about the different countries' experiences in terms of spectrum, but also trials and, and the 5G strategies. Next slide, please. But another regulatory question is smaller cells, that's great, but what are the implications of network densification? Who wants to be close to a small cell? And uh, simply put, this means that under the current power density levels in many OECD countries, 5G cannot be deployed up to the lamppost. And if uh, data is the, the new oil of, of the economies, for example, or in driverless cars, we would need more um, deployment of, of cell towers closer to the user in order to reduce latency. So this cuts across many issues that we see in the, uh, in, in the OECD from transport to, to many other aspects, uh, data, privacy, many other things. And we're looking very closely at 5G and, and intersect with Internet of Things as well as AI. So next slide, please. We look into country studies. There's many 5G trials. I just mentioned a few here, Japan and, and Korea. Korea in the Winter Olympics in February made <coughs> one of the first displays of 5G ser services with virtual reality, augmented reality. But there's many, many other countries that are running trials. And um, next slide, please as well as 5G strategies. At, at the European level, there's a, there's a strategy, but also Australia, France, uh, Korea. It's interesting, the Korean strategy, because they are thinking about DNA, data networks, and AI. So they really think that AI can help optimize networks in order to provide more coverage. And so this, this is something that we saw yesterday. I was talking to a company <coughs> in Finland that has uh, um, been very, um, groundbreaking and providing large coverage of their 4G services, they have a network operations fully automated and they're using machine learning and an AI to enhance quality of services. So this is just to say that there is an intersect between what we're talking about network deployment and, and new uh, developments in, in the industry. So finally, um, I'll just go back to the basics. This means that many of our core traditional telecom issues like streamlining rights of way, efficient spectrum management, um, access to backhaul uh, facilities, how to foster investment in, in deployment of networks will become even more crucial. So we have to, it keeps regulators on our feet, but also it, it requires uh, new partnerships that are arising between industry verticals and horizontal players like the telecom operators, as well as new partnerships among countries like the 5G corridors in Europe in order to make fully automated vehicles a reality. So I've just set the field here for a discussion and happy to take your questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexei, for a very comprehensive introduction, very insightful. Um, I would now ask uh, Monji Marzouk, uh, the Senior Vice President in charge of uh, Internet and Sustainable Energy Governance at Orange. You have very extensive experience in digital industry and uh, Minister in, of ICTs in Tunisia. So you have a very, very uh, broad break, uh, background. Can you please give us our view on the topic? Thank you. More than half of world's population remain unconnected, according to last ITU uh, estimates. And they expect that more than 49% of the global population will be online by the end of this year. For emergent countries, and as you know, Orange is running more than 20 ne mobile networks in Africa, mobile is the, the platform for digital economy in this country innovation and inclusion. Nevertheless, connectivity and inclusivity remain a challenge for the unconnected into more, uh, mainly in more in remote areas. The IGF community has identified five main dimensions uh, for and policy 
option for increasing uh, connectivity. The first one, deploying infrastructure, physical infrastructure, broadband, Wi-Fi, spectrum, mobile, and universal access. Second, increasing usability, applications, service, online service, local content, media and accessibility, media accessibility, sorry. Third, enabling users, human rights, inclusiveness, user literacy, digital citizenship, and entrepreneurship. Fourth, ensuring affordability of access to internet. Cost, mainly based on cost of access uh, to, uh, to the network. And the last one, creating an enabling environment. Access should be universal, equitable, secure, reliable, and affordable. And many, like government, regulatory authorities, and private sector has to contribute to that. It's clear that government policy play a central role in access exp uh, expansion, ensuring efficient spectrum management, promoting by promoting digital infrastructure investment, encouraging network, including spectrum sharing, network sharing and spectrum sharing, improving affordable and reliable uh, access to electricity on grid and off grid, fostering online service on local content and ensuring a level of playing field for the players. In fact, Telecom operators still face considerable technical and financial challenges in expanding networks into more remote regions. According to the Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development uh, report, I IQ, <coughs> sorry, IQ estimates that connecting the next 1.5 billion people will cost more than 450 uh, billion of uh, dollars. Will and how 5G and IoT contribute to expand and improve connectivity and inclusivity? For many developing countries, access to electricity, water, education, healthcare, and transport remain the main challenges. Digital advanced technologies like 5G IoT will play a critical role to address more efficient these basic needs. Indeed, 5G will increase and enrich mobile connectivity, which is the core connectivity form in emergent uh, countries, while, while IoT will provide smart and optimized platform, platforms and applications. Both will improve and modernize the management of public utilities, business compensate in case of lack of legal of uh, legacy infrastructure and trigger innovation in new service to the general public. So 5G may offer a great opportunity compared to, to previous cellular technologies. 5G technology is expected to, to bring, sorry, to bring ultra capacity, ultra high rate, ultra low latency massive co connectivity, expand the IoT for the support of vertical industries, reliability and low latency, but also ultra and low energy consumption and ultra low cost networks for lower RPU and low density area. And more advanced traffic management, multi-service, multi-sliced and, and, uh, and slicing. All these features will permit to imagine imagine and produce services and application well adapted to local uh, needs. But what about network and energy uh, costs? Network costs, despite that 5G technology may prove less expensive per bit than previous generation, McKenzie foresees that total cost of ownership for mobile access network will increase dependently and this dependently on data growth and industry circumstances. The number of radio sites is the bigger factor driving the total cost of ownership TCO, followed by maintenance and engineering costs. But in fact, uh, as uh, I used to be an engineer in telecommunication, st starting from 2G uh, up to uh, 3G and the beginning 4G, I can tell you that the main factor for coverage is frequency. 
is to have low frequency, frequency lower than one gigahertz. It's the main factor, the, in the, the key to have a better coverage, more than what we can bring with technology. So for 5G, it's better for coverage to cover remote area to have, for example, 700 bands uh, in, this, in this country. In a 5G network, automation of performances and operations process, optimization, site visit, drive testing, and advanced radio access network configuration, cloud or centralized radio access network, virtual radio access network may help to reduce maintenance, engineering, and site rental costs. The concept, concept of frugal 5G with only cost effective feature, we implement in 5G only cost-effective features, and introduced in India may be considered in many developing countries at least in a first step to expand internet connectivity to remote area. You uh, uh, know also that access to power to electricity uh, is a main issue to expand access to internet in main Africa uh, country. So, what is about energy costs for 5G? You know, massive MIMU with low uh, spectrum, uh, low band spectrum, and uh, massive MIMU, which improve the, the gain of antenna, and complex 5G baseband processing will increase energy costs, which already represent an important percentage of site running costs. In 5G, several critical functions or being automated to ensure energy efficiency, artificial intelligence, according to traffic load. In addition, renewable energy will help to ensure cost-effective sources of electricity to mobile networks and devices. And as you may know, in Africa and main country now in the world, more than 140 or 45 countries now introduced, uh, uh, they open the, the production of uh, power uh, from renewable energy to a private uh, sector in order to develop and to provide more power in this, uh, in this area, mainly in Africa. 5G and IoT. So, uh, yes, uh, one or two minutes. 5G and IoT expected to expand and improve connectivity and inclusivity Connectivity 5G will significantly enrich mobili mo uh, mobile connectivity for the benefit of consumers, innovators, and business. It will create opportunities to enhance user experiences for digital service, application, and content, and to innovate in this work and uh, in, uh, in work and in uh, commerce. Uh, 5G uh, features and IoT applications will be much more important for the developing countries such as smart transport system, e-health, education, smart grid, agriculture, and disaster relief. Thank you for atten your attention. Many thanks, Simonji, uh, that the, 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 the angle from Africa and developing countries is, is particularly relevant for, for our discussion. I will now pass uh, the words to uh, the, com the floor to Commissioner um, Juan Manuel Wilches, uh, Wilches uh, from the Commission for Communications Regulation in Colombia. Um, uh, you all also have uh, extensive experience in the telecommunications and you can bring us the very insightful angle of the public interest of, of the regulator. Thank you so much for for joining us. Please go ahead. No, thank you for the invitation to the panel. Uh, I apologize for being a little bit late. I was in another panel participating and it took longer than expected. But well, um, I was thinking about the, what to say at the beginning of this panel. Uh, being a regulator, uh, you usually tend to think that regulators uh, like to regulate. Uh, in the case of CRC, we don't. We don't like to regulate. Um, and when you talk about uh, technology adoption, 5G, IoT, and how governments can try to approach those new technologies and how to manage to uh, develop those kind of uh, new solutions uh, in any of our countries, um, what I thought was that um, you need to think on the best way to promote the development of uh, digital services, the new the application of those technologies into the day-to-day -day lives. Uh, we, we don't need to think about networks, probably. Uh, that's, that's something that comes with the 
uh, implementation of technologies. We don't need to think too much or regulate too much uh, uh, what needs to be done and, and a lot of rules on you need to do this and implement this kind of uh, specific uh, standards or whatever for these technologies. I guess uh, what the CRC has done in the last few years is to think about how to uh, become more a promoter of the digital uh, development and digital, uh, transform digital transformation of our country instead of uh, trying to regulate or, or to impose charges on uh, or uh, uh, things on uh, impose rules or new regulations on telecom providers. Uh, we need to think about the best way for telecom companies to uh, develop those digital services that complement their traditional telecom offer. And for that, we need to think on how to best uh, promote the definition of digital transformation initiatives that encompass the, di the, the network uh, side of things with the application, how to take that to a regional uh, perspective with the academy, the industry, and how to apply those technologies in day-to-day -day, uh, productive activities, for example, in agriculture or uh, any other economic sector. Um, that will be obviously based on uh, policies for the country, and we need to coordinate a lot uh, that regulation that regulators are issuing with the policies in terms of digital transformation and how to best uh, to construct or pave the way for digital telecom companies to be the ones who provide those solutions to the industry and to the different um, um, companies, uh, uh, ent entrepreneurs that need to develop those kind of uh, solutions for the provision of services to the final user. Uh, based on that, there are some things also that need to be discussed in terms of um, how to think about uh, when I'm saying that we don't regulate is to, to simplify regulation and to re regulate as much, uh, as, little, so, as little as possible. Um, so there are a couple of recommendations. There's a document from GSMA from February 2018, which talks about what is the best way for regulators to build that regulatory environment to promote the, the, the adoption of these technologies. And that includes six points uh, that I, I guess Alexia also touched on uh, a little while. Um, the first one is spectrum management. You need to define uh, the different frequency bands that are going to be used. Um, you need to promote deployment of front and backhaul. Uh, that means uh, promote competition in those telecommunications market that will allow to connect the different cell sites in uh, all the different uh, areas of the country. Uh, so it's just competition and, and try to promote competition among stakeholders, among the different market players. Uh, you need to find ways to develop new sites. Uh, a lot of new sites will be needed for 5G. A lot of new sites would be needed to connect all the different IoT devices that are going to be uh, uh, located everywhere in the country. So you need to find coverage and need to for the companies to do that. Uh, the fourth point is to have network sharing agreements uh, to be free among operators. Uh, the regulators shouldn't impose obligations or prices uh, to, on those uh, agreements. Uh, we already took a decision about uh, 18 months ago um, because we were uh, and we didn't impose any obligations on operators to, to share besides the obligation to just uh, uh, share uh, essential facilities because we didn't want to impose and to uh, impose rules or restrictions on the way in which operators are, were collaborating to deploy networks and infrastructure. Uh, I guess Alexia talked about the uh, uh, network densification and, and how we need to promote that development and that deployment in the different uh, regions of the country. And to also talk about, about uh, define the power density limits, the uh, radiation that uh, cell sites produce, and how you need to work. And that's one of the key things that we need to work uh, in Colombia. It's uh, to work with communities, to work with uh, municipalities, to allow the deployment of infrastructure. If we don't work with communities, if we don't work with the local, uh, the mayor of the municipality, they're not going to allow the deployment of those cell sites. 
all those new uh, small micro uh, pico cells that need to be deployed are not going to be uh, deployed if we don't work as a government, as a regulator, as a ministry of ICTs with the municipalities to allow deployment of that infrastructure. And that's, I guess, one of the problems that not only Colombia but many other countries have. Uh, a lot of the communities are thinking about health issues, environmental issues. Um, uh, like in the case of Colombia, there are a lot of uh, people that take advantage of that and that they uh, get uh, to the communities with messages about you don't, you cannot um, allow for this uh, cell site to be deployed, but then they're charging a lot of money to the operator for the deployment in a, in a specific location. So we need to work with uh, municipalities and we need to work with communities to understand, make them understand the benefits that they have of having infrastructure close to them. It's better for, for the infrastructure to be close and not to be farther away. Um, I wanted to I wanted to mention, uh, just uh, to close my, my, my first intervention, a um, uh, report that was published by ITU uh, July, I guess, this year. Um, and there's a conclusion there. They talk about uh, that deployment of 5G could probably increase uh, the digital divide uh, because investment in infrastructure, these new technologies, could take place only in larger cities, uh, densely populated cities, and the infrastructure in the rural areas is not going to be deployed. So I guess it would be good to discuss what's the best way for governments to manage to uh, uh, make a good balance of we need to deploy 5G, but we need to complement that with coverage and service in other rural areas and how to connect people in those uh, areas that probably are not connected. 50, uh, around 50% 50 of people in Colombia don't have, uh, are not connected to the internet uh, and we need to for the, that people to be connected. So how would, do we deploy that infrastructure? And how do we manage to, for them to appropriate the technology if, we don't have five, if they don't have 5G? They wouldn't have 5G, 5G in, I don't know, two, three, four years, maybe more than that. But the people in the cities are gonna have that. So how are, are we gonna manage in our policies um, uh, of digital inclusion that connectivity in those areas, even if it's not 5G? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so, as we can see from the, this first set of speakers, uh, what we are discussing here is a moment in which if we do not address seriously issues of connectivity and inclusion, uh, our shiny new technologies might end up setting us more apart than we are right now. So instead of uh, bridging the gaps, we will be enlarging the gaps uh, from those who have access to this technology and those who who don't have. If we think that the digital gap in terms of those who are connected to the internet and not connected to the internet, it's a serious enough problem, uh, the tendency is for those problems to be uh, really stressed out and really uh, make it way larger uh, with the deployment of new technologies such as those that we are discussing here. So now what we're going to do is to turn into a deep dive on AI. Uh, so the framework uh, might be different, but the ideas that we are discussing are the same. So how can we make sure uh, that from the start, uh, from the set off of those technologies, especially on AI deployments, we make sure that connectivity and inclusion is right there from the start. So we have three very different perspectives. Uh, we will begin uh, with uh, Smita Prasad, uh, offering an Indian perspective from uh, the, the CCG, from the National Law University from uh, Delhi. Uh, so Smita, if you want to um, lead on. Sure. Uh, thank you, Carlos. So, um, as was mentioned already, I think uh, AI is probably one of the big technological developments that there's been a lot of discussion on at the IGF and just generally in the recent past. And we're all here because it's clear that this trajectory of discussion is going to continue over the coming years. And um, inclusion and diversity within this space is an issue that many people have raised, including Carlos and the other colleagues on this panel. Uh, but in this context, I think I'd like to focus a little bit on the Indian perspective, but also just move, uh, the need to move beyond developed economies when we speak of AI and inclusion. Um, the conversation on AI has 
typically been dominated by actors from developed com uh, countries in the global north. And one of the big reasons for this is that the technology is often developed in these regions. It just makes it more accessible for people from the, in these countries to talk about it. Um, and this also means that while there is discussion on inclusion um, and accessibility and diversity, ethics, all of these, like, and rights-based issues, many of these discussions are also focused or, uh, on the, the issues that are raised in the developed countries in the global north. While, of course, this discussion is much needed, I think the emphasis here is that uh, the effect of this, these kind of technologies is felt all across the world. Many of these large tech companies that are developing AI are aggressively marketing their services and their products to emerging markets, to people in the emerging markets, and uh, the, the technology that they develop will affect everyone. Um, and, but at the same time, the way in which we identify and deal with issues of inclusion and diversity in different ju uh, jurisdictions differs vastly. Our, uh, it's, I mean, just basic things like our politics, our religions, and our cultures differ, and this means that also the language that we use to dis discuss discrimination and other issues like this is different. I mean, that's that's literally and figuratively. Um, so, you know, on a lighter note, people may, like the makers of self-driving cars may joke that they know they've achieved their goals when they build a car that can survive in Mumbai. Uh, there's also bigger issues where um, the way that, uh, uh, you know, the use of social media fil filtering mechanisms and algorithms uh, affects elections in countries like Brazil and India very differently from the way they would affect the US and that like something that we've been discussing a lot in the past. Uh, at the same time, there's also issues of like you, the use of AI in healthcare where common diseases in different jurisdictions may just not be heard of in uh, more developed economies. Um, and then there's also the more basic issues that we just discussed in terms of access to, to, um, to uh, internet, uh, literacy, uh, digital literacy, different issues here. And so I think it's important that uh, we take all of this into account um, and build in the, the not so homogeneous Global South values into the data sets that we're developing to, uh, that we're using to develop AI. But the other important thing is also to make sure that there's representation in the communities that actually engage in building and developing these technologies. Um, and this is something that, uh, like to step away a little bit from the rights-based issues, this is something that many countries uh, uh, have been discussing, right, and they've taken note of. And this is not specific to the Global South. A lot of European countries are uh, working towards catching up in this AI race, and, but also a lot of Asian countries are working on this. Uh, and many countries have developed uh, policy frameworks to, uh, to kind of identify how they will engage with AI and um, how they will leverage new technology in their countries, whether it's for public services or private actors. Um, and here I'd like to discuss a little bit the ex in the Indian example. Um, so India has been all, as one of the countries that has policy frameworks that address AI, and AI has come up in discussions not just in specific targeted policy frameworks on AI, but also our policies on data protection, on e-commerce companies. Um, so this is a big issue. They, they want they want uh, to facilitate innovation in India, uh, and they're trying to identify how to do that. And unfortunately, the issues that I discussed earlier on the rights-based um, issues, the discrimination, the inclusion, is not something that's really shown up much in these discussions. But what has shown up is the question of how to facilitate innovation. And um, one of the ways that they're talking about doing this, for example, is to mandate storage of personal data in India and then make sure that this personal data is then, uh, the data sets are given to Indian startups so that they can use these data sets to build um, AI technology. Um, so, you know, it's, um, and we've seen this in draft policy so far, it's not something that's been done yet. But I think it begs the question of whether um, ensuring that there is better representation and ensuring that technology is built in the global south as well as the global north uh, means that this is the only way to do it, and if this is the best way to do it. Uh, and I think you know, there, there's need for more discussion 
among all stakeholders to kind of address these kind of questions. Um, especially given that there are other implications, there, is, there are implications of privacy and um, other human rights involved in this, these questions. So I, I'll stop there and then maybe we can take this discussion further. Thank you, Smita. And then uh, we turn to uh, Christian Daffal from the Hubboat uh, Internet Institute. So, Chris. Yes, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Carlos. My name is uh, Christian Jeffal, so there's a, a J um, uh, in, in my uh, name just uh, for you to know. It's an Algerian name, so it's not easy to spell. I. I know that. I'll um, try my best <laughs> next time. Sorry, Chris. Uh, no reflection on you, of course. Um, I'm um, working at the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society in Berlin, where I had a project on um, digital public administration. I'm also involved um, as a member of the civil society in the open government um, partnership, um, working with the German government on opening up um, uh, the automated system, in, um, including some transparency into automated systems of the pu um, public administration, and I'm also a member of the National E-Government Competence Center in, in Germany. Having said um, this, so I'll give you a German perspective uh, today, focusing first on AI, um, uh, a little bit, and then um, uh, touching upon two other points, uh, which is um, in relation to AI organization and strategy. What's really um, interesting to me uh, in, in the AI discourse is that we keep revisiting very basic, uh, very basic topic of uh, topics of AI and um, talking about uh, concepts, which could be due to the fact that AI is an emerging technology and um, there is a lot of um, technical developments. So this would be in parallel with the 5G um, a narrative that you have like a three, four, five G and, and AI is building up. We're talking now a lot about um, 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 evolutionary algorithms, so there's new um, technologies creeping, uh, creeping in. But uh, what I would suggest um, to you today is that um, I think uh, the reason why, um, why this um, discussion um, is, is uh, more and more vital is that we see the social purposes uh, more clearly. And um, this is due to the fact that AI yeah. is a general purpose, um, general purpose uh, technology um, that, and we are just about to encounter the different, um, different social purposes it can have. And um, uh, you could see that actually at this very uh, IGF uh, in different panels where um, talking about discrimination and inclusion in some panels it was uh, specifically mentioned um, that we are worried about um, discriminatory, uh, discriminatory uh, AI systems. Um, this discussion started with, um, of course, um, also systems in, in e-government um, that actually distinguish between uh, different classes uh, due to ethnicity. But then, and there is a very interesting use case in, in school administration uh, in the US, but also in other places, when they found out that um, the algorithms Um, that the algorithms um, uh, that the algorithms discriminated, they actually used those systems, turned them around, and um, took the information in order to tackle discrimination. So here you have um, you have a clear example of how just the social purpose um, we are we are um, focusing at could turn around what these. Um, what these um, uh, applications uh, applications mean. And this is what I mean by general purpose technology. It can be used in very, very different ways. And uh, to give you just, uh, and I think this is really, really important um, to, to stress, to give you some examples, um, just to open up the space of imagination in, in that regard. I mean, um, uh, electricity, for example, you can, you can run a dentist chair or an electric chair um, with um, the same technology. And um, if, if I get a little bit more, um, uh, if I include a little bit more pathos in that, uh, and uh, since we are in a, um, a 
building of the United Nations, we say swar uh, swords to plowshares, which also tells you about um, about uh, the general purpose of of metal. So this is um, a very uh, broad point um, that I would like to um, uh, to make and really to stress to you. Um, for my for the second um, argument I would like to make and this is that when we talk about AI we talk a lot about micromanagement of applications so all the um, very good initiatives um, that come up with principles um, of, of AI um, talk about um, uh, non-discrimination and um, a fairness and, and things like that. And I think this topic of inclusion reminds us that there is not only the micro level, but also a macro level, a, a general a general level um, uh, that is very important, but that we don't really see. And um, I think this is very much about governance and the broader topic of inclusion, I think reminds us about this macro level. And uh, I would like to stress this with, with um, two points. And uh, my general metaphor uh, for this is actually the very room uh, we're sitting in. Because we are at a multi-stakeholder conference talking about inclusion. And I've seen so many people passing by looking in uh, unable to to come in, um, uh, which is actually uh, I'm I'm actually mad at myself uh, because I said, how can I be um, part of of such a setting where I said I want to have an inclusive uh, discussion, but uh, like uh, like a sheep I um, uh, I accept. Um, uh, of course, there is reasons for that. I completely uh, I completely understand them, and I don't want to start a revolution here. But it's very uh, I think nevertheless it's very important for us. This is uh, such a such a macro uh, reason, which um, shows you how the architecture, in a way, um, frames us and brings us uh, into a, into a setting where we automatically um, uh, accept certain things and leave people out. And I've seen dozens of people actually looking in and and uh, passing passing by. So, what are my points um, for uh, AI in this regard? One is um, organization. Uh, we see a lot of movement in, in that regard. And um, I think uh, one, uh, one is the struggle of the United Nations to find the right forum for AI, something which is not uh, has not really addressed in the, in the fora I went to. But um, there is, of course, it's always an organization. You know that if you work for an entity, even in civil society, everybody tries to, in a way, um, uh, get onto issues that's I think a human uh, lies in, in human nature but we are actually at the moment um, currently um, uh, looking who is, is responsible um, uh, in this um, organizational setting founded in 1945 and uh, developed uh, in, in waves uh, for me uh, the, uh, the, the decisive mo the, my eerie moment of understanding was uh, this, this March I think or May when um, the ITU and um, the UN Development Agency hosted AI uh, meetings in parallel on the same uh, topics and could not agree to, to merge the meetings, even though they both tackled humanitarian and development, uh, development issues. So, um, and um, the other thing I would like to, um, uh, I would like to uh, comment is in uh, terms of organization, uh, very much uh, the democratic design and uh, multi-stakeholderism, which leads me to my second point, um, strategy. We are now, I think, in a point where um, this architecture I was uh, telling you about is made. So as we are speaking now, the German government um, uh, will um, decide on its, its um, AI strategy. And two points I would like to mention that um, uh, are already um, known to the public is that they will include um, a big uh, bunch of um, measures that actually um, link uh, the German efforts in, in public administration but also in other fields to development policies so that this has a big uh, has been a big part of um, of the strategy which um, I think is um, is we haven't seen in, in a lot of uh, strategies so far and um, like uh, the Canadian government, they also want to found an AI observatory, um, uh, really uh, understanding social impacts and looking 
um, at the development of technology as we go. <coughs> and I'm uh, actually, I'm in, in many ways, I'm uh, getting more and more optimistic about the strategic development due to the fact um, that um, AI, the strategy, uh, strategy game started out a little bit as a, as a weapons race, and it was uh, commented in many instances, but now um, uh, we, uh, I think only three months ago, the Chinese government stressed that they would like to um, cooperate and they were open to, to partnerships. Um, the Russian president talked about um, sharing knowledge uh, about AI and um, uh, the European Union, these are the examples um, I know, but uh, you can complement them. The European Union um, actually um, uh, tried to uh, uh, have a common strategy, including also non-EU uh, member states, uh, that was um, also focused on social and ethical uh, issues. Um, uh, I would like to to close um, uh, and also uh, to to um, point my my questions to you, um, because I think in a way we have to um, also discuss what the role of the IGF is in that regard. Um, and I think it, it should also be mentioned, and um, I think uh, scholars can, can say these things more easily, that um, the IGF is in a way at a crossroads. Uh, we had now successive meetings in Geneva, Paris, and uh, Berlin, which uh, might be a sign that in a way um, support is shrinking for this um, forum. And um, uh, I think if we stop to be engaged and innovative, um, this could be um, this could be a problem for the future, and I'm not worried that the IGF would, will be abolished. But um, coming back to Carlos, um, uh, Carlos' uh, comment, I think the big danger here is that the IGF will be a fig leaf for an actually widening, uh, widening uh, digital uh, divide and um, a fig leaf for uh, many um, uh, bad developments. Um, that uh, that could take place if if we don't um, uh, be be active. So I'm looking forward to the discussion, and I thank you for your uh, attendance. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And I, I think you hit, you end up raising a, a very interesting question, which is when we think about uh, inclusion and accessibility, you bring this layer of internet governance, uh, and when we question who is going to handle the global discussion on those technologies, and especially on AI, there is this big question mark uh, on this uh, sort of uh, decision of different international fora, and uh, of course, different fora will offer different opportunities for inclusion and engagement, so there is an important layer of internet governance uh, for us to consider here. So very quickly, I'll turn to uh, Eduardo Magrani now from uh, ITS Rio to offer a Brazilian perspective uh, on those topics. And uh, right after, we we'll open up for questions from the audience uh, in order for us to make it more uh, into a lively debate in the in the final segment of our uh, of our panel. So, Eduardo, please. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Carlos. I'm very happy to be in this panel. First of all, because thanks to the merge, we can talk from 5G to new personhood for intelligent robots. So, this is a very interesting. Um, opportunity to talk about those issues. Uh, this Italian ethicist, Luciano Floridi, says that humanity enters now in the era of design, and let's hope it's the era of good and not bad design. And that's where my speech starts to connect a lot with the speech from Christian. Um, our behaviors are being guided now uh, through architectures and through online platforms. That's why we must pay a lot of attention in those new environments we have today. When we talk about IoT, the first step is connectivity. So that's why it's very important for us to address uh, issues from the global south. For example, connectivity today, access to the internet is now a human right. This is a statement from the UN from 2014, from the rapporteur Frank LaRue, and it's been more and more important, this digital democracy and digital issues we have on our civic relation with the state also. So connectivity is the first step Half of the population doesn't have internet access, 
And in Brazil, we have pretty much the same scenario. Almost half of the population in Brazil simply doesn't exist online. So how it can jeopardize many civic rights we have today in the internet environment. Um, this problem of digital divide can create a huge gap, as Carlos was also addressing, between developed countries and emerging countries in terms of what we can do with digital innovation, digital awareness, or capacity building. I think the problem of digital divide nowadays can create a huge gap on the labor force in those developing countries, such as Brazil, India, or some other countries from the global south. So that's the first step we should address when we talk about AI and IoT. We should not forget that access to the internet is a human right and is the first step. So coming to the IoT scenario, when you talk about IoT, we could also create a synonym that uh, Internet of Things is also the Internet of Sensors but also the Internet of Algorithms, Intelligent Robots, and People. We could also address the IoT as the Internet of People because it can process big data all the time, and big data many times comes to personal data. So the conclusion is big data are us at the end of the, of the road. So IoT is also important for human beings and should be addressed through human values. And that, I think that's an important statement also. From a post-humanist perspective, we could state that things have agency, such as Bruno Latour likes to address. Christian was telling that our behavior is model is guided through architecture or digital platforms or things, we could say, right? So um, those things that have agency need to be regulated as such, um, I should say, from different levels of agency. When we talk about thing, connected things or AI, we should differentiate things that has narrow AI or strong AI because they can act and in interact with us in a completely different way. We should not regulate um, a simple tool in the same way we should regulate intelligent algorithms with, with the capacity to auto-program themselves, such as many things that we can, uh, we could sit right now that are producing damages, such as autonomous car or intelligent algorithms, such as Ty from Microsoft and many others that are already producing damages. So I think we should come to a common ground between different uh, concepts of things, connected things, and also AI to think about different regulations from those um, connected devices. When we talk about the importance of inclusion in this scenario, we could also address the importance of inclusive engineering. Many problems, many damages we see today on the AI scenario um, began with the exclusion part in the design phase. So that's why I think inclusive engineering, including minorities and have a better gender balance on AI development is crucial for us to have a better architecture in this. And also the GDPR and the Brazilian regulation data protection talks about the right to explanation. And on the AI scenario, the inclusion discussion also passes through the right to explanation debate. AI technologies should be explainable since they guide our behavior all the time. And transparency is a crucial part of those new technologies. We should not interact um, with black boxes, right? So those new technologies should be more and more open and transparent by default. And talking about by default, I think the rule of law should change a little bit in this scenario, paying more and more attention to the design phase. phase. We, sh we should think about value-sensitive design and how to include human values on the design phase of these new and intelligent artifacts. So just a quick remark that we can explore more on the debate with the audience. Thanks. So 
Thank you, Eduardo. Uh, so now we have um, our, our two segments on 5G and uh, AI exploring issues of connectivity and, and inclusion. Uh, for this next part of, uh, uh, of our session, we would love to hear from you uh, in the audience if you have remarks, questions, comments uh, that uh, some of our panelists might, uh, might address. So this is open up the floor to you. Do we have any comments, questions, remarks from the audience at this time? Please, please feel free to do so. So, to gentlemen down there, if you want to just uh, say your name for the for the recording, okay? Um, my name is Olumide Babalala from Nigeria. So, my question goes to Christian. Um, you you expressed your fears on the continued um, sustenance or um, importance of IGF. Uh, although I was in a particular forum yesterday, and we also discussed the um, sad occurrence of coming together to discuss all these issues year in, year out. And somebody even made the joke that the, the slides that were used two years ago could still be used this year and it will still be relevant. And I find it um, almost very true. So uh, in your, from your perspective, what would you say, how would you advise, what would be the advice for the, for the improvement of whatever IGF is doing and for the continued relevance and for IGF itself to be able to achieve its purpose? Uh, Chris, before you, you answer, do we have any uh, follow-up questions to this first round? If not, Chris, go ahead. Um, thank you very much for that uh, for that uh, question, um, and also it's uh, it's these sad jokes uh, that that really make you reflect uh, the most. Because in the beginning I was laughing, but then I was thinking that's uh, that's actually a very very sad joke you, uh, joke you made, and I think. Um, I cannot um, give you um, the the recipe to to go forward, but I think what we should do is we should think about the strengths of the the IGF and the things that make us come here and that make us come together and that are unique about this forum as compared to other forum fora. And I think if we um, if we have these um, strengths in the back of our head, then we can um, we should also. Um, not um, stop to be innovative and um, <coughs> stick to um, uh, the the ways uh, things have in a way settled at, at the IGF, but also maybe from time to time try some new things and, and um, try to especially, I mean, I think it's interesting that um, the IGF tackles more and more development, uh, more and more technology issues. So maybe we can think about different formats for AI, for the IoT, for, for 5G that in a way um, develop also the, the, um, the forum along as we tackle new technologies, uh, which is not a very concrete answer, but uh, maybe we should think about um, actually connecting um, a little bit and really try to, to um, not only to reflect, but to be innovative. So um, I will try to find you after this, this session just to make contact. <coughs> Thanks. So please go ahead to see your name. Thank you. Thank you very much for the interesting um, contributions. My name is Susan Telter. I'm from ITU in Geneva. Uh, I have one small comment, and then I have a question for the panelists. Um, my comment is about um, the, I hear a lot in many of the sessions uh, here and elsewhere that half the population has access to the internet and the others don't. And um, I used to be in charge, actually, of producing the data, so I know it uh, quite well. And I just wanted to make a small comment about that because the data, about 50%, refers to internet users. So it is about people actually being online and using the internet. It's not about access in the sense that if they wanted to have internet, they couldn't buy it. Because um, we also publish data on mobile um, population coverage. And we have now about 5 billion people that are living somewhere where there's a 3G network, okay? So it's not just about access in the sense of not being able to buy a package 
and being able to connect, but it's, there are other issues like affordability, skills, content that are very important. I just wanted to mention that because it's used all the time and it's not precise. So, Okay, but uh, having said that, and actually 4G population coverage is also already higher than 50% of the population. So, um, But uh, I have a question to the panelists because um, I think uh, there's an interesting discussion going on here between 5G and um, IoT and AI. And um, my question is, a lot of the policy makers in developing countries have mostly focused on expanding the mobile network, and we have heard about that a lot in terms of different panelists, and, and anyway, we hear it all the time. And, um, but uh, we also hear like the OECD um, um, presentation focused a lot on the uh, fixed uh, backhaul and backbone infrastructure. And I would like to hear a little bit uh, from the panelists about that link, and especially if, if we want to bring um, um, AI, IoT, and uh, the ability to exploit that to remote areas. Uh, what does that mean in terms of the um, technology infrastructure, and especially also when we talk about the, the backbone and the backhaul? Thank you. Thanks a lot. I, I maybe give the floor maybe to Alex or Monji to address these issues. Maybe if I can complement your question, one of the use cases that you talked about is the um, mobile broadband enhancement, and there's also fixed wireless. <coughs> to build on this question, do you think that that can be a tool to actually get coverage to more people? Um, that's an excellent question. Thank you so much for. Both, uh, we also stress at the OECD the difference between internet usage and access. There's different ways of, of measuring access. One is broadband penetration, but there's also coverage. And within coverage, population coverage is one, geographical coverage is another. So even if the population is covered, they, they mostly are in urban areas, then we still are lacking the geographical component. But this is a great precision, and affordability is specifically important for countries like my country, I'm Mexican, where for many years this was one of the main barriers due to lack of competition. So we tried to stress the importance of institutional framework and regulation that promotes competition in order to bring prices down to, to eliminate, and it's one of the barriers, which is affordability. And in terms of 5G, and in, in general, on wireless networks and fixed networks, um, although there's been a lot of talk in Europe and many other fora about fixed and wireless substitution, um, of services. In see, indeed, the networks are complementary. The core network of a wireless network is fixed infrastructure, and um, we w the, the difference that we see with the evolution of wireless um, is that the fixed infrastructure has to grow more into uh, closer to the user. So more and more, we will we'll see this network, what we call network densification, which uh, brings um, just exacerbates the issues that we've seen in, in many uh, emerging countries. In 2014, I had the privilege to do a telecom review of Colombia, and um, the fixed network infrastructure was highly uh, um, incipient, and many times um, regulation didn't tackle the fix because most emerging economies think wireless, wireless, wireless. And um, we, we keep on saying this, that um, not only fiber backhole and backbone bone is the complementary part, but in OECD countries, 70% of data is mobile data is downloaded into the Wi-Fi. So the, the quality of, of wireless networks increases with more fixed infrastructure, even in the access part, not only the core networks. So this is something definitely to, to keep in mind and will also become more and more important as we evolve into the generations um, the reason why I tried to start with the presentation saying this is the road to 5G and, and try to bring back to reality the hype that we have, the benefits that we will see for 5G in the usage case scenarios will only be there as much as we work in the foundation of the digital economy, which is the access part. And access not only the access to just a simple 256 kilobit internet connection, access to high quality broadband. For, for all, like, within countries and among countries. And we're trying to work uh, to, to promote this. It was recently in Southeast Asia 
working on a, on a toolkit for how to connect SMEs, and, and many of their issues there resonated with what I've seen in Latin America. Um, and they say, yeah, but what, how can we do to, to, bring, to, to make broadband affordable? And that has a lot to do with institutional frameworks and, and how sound they are, how they promote investment, how they, how they promote competition. And, and so we're trying to work together, I know the ITU as well, that they're doing these efforts and as part of the sustainable development goals. And just to finalize this, I was pleasantly surprised in February that the World Bank uh, signed a partnership with the GSMA for IoT and big data for development. And the World Bank is bringing this, this, uh, this new perspective that they really think that IoT will help um, developing countries come into the digital transformation. And we also think so at the OECD. So um, I leave you with those food for thought. Thank you, Roji. Uh, can I ask you uh, to relate this to also the demand and the problem that you referred in, in, in Africa? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, to complete, in fact, thank you very much for the clarification between uh, access and coverage, and also coverage of population and coverage of the geography. And as I uh, mentioned in my uh, speech, that the mean, the mean need, in fact, for better coverage for remote area is to make available low band frequency at 700 megahertz, at 800 megahertz, is the main, uh, even before technology 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G. The second thing, it's too low to share, or as, uh, even a common network between operators in low traffic area, to share spectrum, to share network. I agree with you that if we want to connect radio sites you know, in many Africa countries, the fixed network as ADSL, uh, copper, until uh, to the home is very low. The usage is no, I, I don't have the figures, but lower than 5% or uh, they have broadband, fixed broadband in, uh, in, in Africa and mainly in sub-Saharan uh, Africa. So to allow, in fact, the mean, so the mean, uh, the mobile network is core, is the main form to access to internet in, uh, in Africa, in the, perhaps all uh, Africa countries. So to allow to connect radio sites with fiber. Because until now, uh, 2G we have used only microwaves. So to, to allow to, 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 to connect with fiber in order to allow more bandwidth, more traffic. And as you know, more than 50%, I think 60% or more, of uh, broadband traffic is video. But we can, in fact, provide and uh, uh, develop many applications without need video or without need uh, high definition video. So we can optimize the traffic in order to optimize coverage at least at at the first step. This is what I uh, uh, indicate the, the concept of frugal network, five, frugal 5G network as defined in India. Okay. Christina, it seems that we have two questions from <coughs> the remote participants. Um, yeah, we were um, sent two questions from uh, Yana Fung at netmission.asia. Um, she is asking how we can eliminate the gap between the labor force and the rate of rapidly changing technological world. Um, and she also, as she is very active in Asia with the Asia Pacific Youth IGF, she wonders how uh, in, uh, we can help eliminate the digital divide when there is an urge to have technology advancement. Thank you. So who would like to start from our panelists? Go first, please. Thank you very much for, for the question. Uh, recently we published a, a report on rural digital divides and the different um, strategies that governments are doing, but also the, technolog the technology. And, and one point of view is that um, technology keeps advancing. It doesn't have borders. What we have to update is, is our, our policy frameworks and how we get up to, to bring everybody online. 
how to foster investment in the networks for everybody to enjoy the digital transformation. And um, it, this is a concern, the rural and urban digital divides not only a concern in emerging countries, uh, Sweden is also very rural uh, and they, part of their main concern is how to get the last 10% up into high broadband connectivity targets that they have. So this is a common um, concern, I think, for the whole world. And as much as, as we, we, we try to, to build policies in order to foster deployment of networks by private players where they can and complement that with public-private partnerships or, or EU funds or government funds where, where it's not commercially viable, we'll be able to close these this gaps. But one precision is that it's not only access to basic internet, which is what has been declared in many constitutions as a, as a, a human right is the access to high-speed broadband that will actually bring the productivity enhancements that we need to, to, take, to everybody to take advantage of the digital transformation. Yes, just adding up to that, the pace of technology is very fast. And sometimes public policies are very, very slow, such as leg legislations in Brazil we had a national plan for the high-speed broadband, and it was a fail. It took many, many years, and when the project was launched, it wasn't adequate anymore. So this is a problem. I, I think governments should be more aware of the pace of technology to try to make it faster, to make it adequate, right? And it connects also to the speech of Christian talking about strategic plans. Uh, Rio de Janeiro, for instance, received the mark of smart city. The problem was that the project itself was completely elitist. It wasn't guided by principle, principles such as openness, transparency, inclusiveness, and non-discrimination. And I think governments should pay attention not only to the pace of technology to try to regulate it better, but also the principles behind all those public initiatives. Juan, if you want to add something. Um, well, I guess when, when we speak about digital divide, um, governments, uh, policymakers, regulators can do a lot to try to connect people in the country. Uh, you can have development of backbone, backhaul, you have a lot of networks, access, get the networks to the, to the people. But even if you do that, you might find out that people don't use or do not connect, do, do not use the internet because they don't have any use for it. Uh, we found uh, there was a very uh, big comprehensive policy that was developed in 2010 in Colombia. Uh, until 2018, it's, it's, fin it's finishing up this, this year. Uh, called Vive Digital. And the first things that we uh, found out in 2010 was that people didn't find a use, Colombian people didn't find a specific use for the internet. There were, uh, I don't know, a lot of programs, uh, adoption programs. The Ministry of ICTs uh, connected 250,000 people, to 100, around 200,000 people uh, using subsidies. They subsidized the broadband connection, but people didn't continue to pay for that, and the sustainability of that in time is very difficult because you have to pay year through year uh, those subsidies. Um, and it's difficult for, for, for the people to for the government to achieve those goals if they didn't combine the deployment of infrastructure with adoption uh, initiatives. And uh, adoption initiatives need to go to understand what are the needs that the different communities have in the country, what are the productive industries that are located in those regions, and how to make a match between the connectivity and the productive industries that are uh, there. So that you have people uh, that use the, connect the connection the access for a productive uh, uh, thing, uh, whatever they do, and try to continue use, to use that connectivity to, uh, for the day-to-day -day lives. So you need to find that, that connection. That was uh, part of the policy defined in 2010. Uh, you have a digital ecosystem in which you have demand, offer and demand. You offer a lot of connectivity. But if you don't have demand, you, do, you cannot develop that, uh, that appropriation that you need from, from, from the <clears throat> from the population. And uh, I guess it's not, a, it's not an easy job. The new government, which started in August uh, this year, 
uh, is still in the process of uh, their goal is to connect 100% of the population and they haven't defined yet the best way to, to do that. Uh, governments in Colombia have tried through Wi-Fi hotspots in different regions of the country, subsidies, uh, connectivity, access, working with uh, public-private partnerships with operators, try to connect everyone. But I guess you need to complement that with a uh, complete digital solution, which includes connectivity um, and uh, uh, content. Thank you. Phoebe, you, you would like to, to ask a question? You're, you're, you're a lecturer in Beijing University of Post and Telecommunications. Can right. you give the angle of side of Asia? Yeah, um, thank you. So um, I'm a lecturer from the uh, Beijing University of Post and Telecommunications in China. So uh, I've been doing researches on 5G enabled intelligent Internet of Things, especially the vehicular networks. So um, like we are submitting proposals for the intelligent transport systems with uh, many vehicle uh, manufacturers. And uh, while talking with them, I realized that uh, instead of the technical barriers, there are many other factors that hold them back from uh, doing massive like production of self-driving cars for com commercial usage. So um, one of the challenges is the um, legislation for these uh, self-driving cars. Um, if we take the safety problem as an example, like uh, up to now, all the uh, confirmation of liabilities in traffic accidents is human-centered. Like the policy identify which driver causes this accident and let him take the corresponding uh, responsibilities, like paying fines or even you know going to jails or whatever. But in the future, uh, in intelligent transportation systems, there's no human involved. Uh, like uh, the reason of the accident may be, you know, uh, maybe embedded system failure, maybe the chip design flaws or algorithm flaws or even remote hacking. So uh, without the participation of human in decision making, how can we identify the responsibilities among, you know, uh, these manufacturer uh, manufacturers like chip makers, algorithm designers, because um, as the commissioner said before, it is very important that we bring these new technologies to people's day-to-day -day life. So we should, uh, is there any like policy frameworks like we can follow to identify the responsibilities among these suppliers so that we can bring more international and diverse companies to the development and uh, uh, for this new type of applications? So, you thank you. Yeah, do I think we are almost running out of time, but uh, we have, yeah, we have time for uh, this one additional, two additional questions. So go ahead, very, very quickly. And, and let's get the second one. Thank you very quickly. Uh, congratulations for this workshop. It has been very useful because actually I think those technologies are close related. Uh, we need 5G to foster IoT, and we need the data generated by IoT to train that artificial intelligence algorithms. Uh, and regarding artificial intelligence, by now, OECD, ITU, uh, UNESCO are working on that field. Uh, at a global level and in your view of the panelists, uh, do you think is the best way to address this global purpose technology? Uh, or we need something like uh, IEF, but for artificial intelligence governance? Thank you. So Chris, if you wanna get this part. Uh, um, both questions, I think, are really worthwhile. So we have it one uh, one time rather on the national uh, level or regional level, and one one time on the international level. 
And um, so my approach would be to, to look at what we want to uh, achieve uh, with, uh, with that, <coughs> starting with the international level. So depending on what fora we, we put it in, um, I think this frames the results. As I was trying to um, to say that with my with this metaphor with the room. So depending on how we we build it and who we give the topics to, um, uh, the results will differ a little bit, and also our discussion will will differ. And um, so my my feeling is that um, we should use existing fora, but uh, only if they're up for the task. So only if they're um, uh, if they're also willing to adapt to a certain certain degree. So I think for IGF, it would be necessary to maybe find uh, new ways, new forms of discussion, and um, uh, to, to, because I think AI governance is in, uh, different from, from internet governance. The principles at stake are, are different. If you look at the core principles which have been discussed here for, for years, and I think it's, uh, there's a lot of clarity and the things, I mean, there are similarities like data protection, but there's also differences. And um, so my suggestion would be to, to think about um, the IGF also, because I think uh, what we need um, in AI governance is meaningful, um, meaningful participation and inclusion. And um, I think the IGF is a very good example um, how, um, how such a process of discussion can be um, uh, can be started, um, but uh, obviously, um, as we heard also from uh, from the participant before, there's a need to reform. And very briefly on the on the national, uh, just to um, I think it's it's in a way the same thing. Here we are also experiment, uh, experimenting with new um, new uh, ways uh, at my institute in a way to have, for example, um, random samples of of um, the population either deciding or um, discussing issues in order to find new ways of government, uh, governance um, of, of AI. Um, if you look, I looked um, only um, on in a few states, but there's a real proliferation of organizations tackling um, AI issues. And um, I think, um, again, uh, there needs to be an inclusive, um, uh, inclusive uh, organization and uh, for example, one worry for me is that we see it a little bit too much, um, in, at least in Europe, through the lenses of data protection um, at the moment. And um, uh, I, I think um, that has to, that this view has to broaden, and we also need to reflect this um, from an organizational, organizational um, uh, standpoint. So I don't have um, the ready-made solution, but I think it would be wrong for me to even to do it because this is part of the discussion uh, we should we should have, and uh, I hope this is a little a little bit satisfactory for for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, we are a bit over time, but we just realized that our session is starting only in five minutes. So I'm going to uh, very thank our panelists and ask you for uh, like a challenging last task. Can you just give us a key line in 30 seconds, each one of you, starting with Eduardo? What is like the key line for you uh, from this workshop? The key line? And then I would invite you to refer to the conclusions and to the report while we, we will try our best to wrap it up. So my key line would be, we need new personhood for intelligent robots because of her question. They are become, becoming more and more autonomous. There will be no causal nexus to give liability to, to those agents. So. Commissioner Juanel? Uh, I guess what I would say is that uh, governments, regulators, policymakers need to understand what's happening. We need to go deeper into uh, getting to know our uh, sector industry and the impact that new technologies are having in that specific uh, environment and try to intervene as less as possible, um, as little as possible. Try to let things flow a little bit, uh, probably some basic principles, and that's it not to try to control everything. We really like that, Christian. <laughs> I, I gave mine already, so I can be very brief. I think it's a formative phase at the moment for AI governance and for you as a multi-stakeholder, no matter from, from uh, where, this is the time to, to get engaged and raise your voice. I think uh, that uh, 5G and the IoT will bring uh, many benefits for emergent country in order to improve, uh, improve access and uh, inclusivity. And I think the policy, in fact, uh, uh, and regulation 
uh, will uh, play uh, an important role to, uh, in fact, to, uh, to benefit from those uh, features. Um, thank you. I just want to take off on what Christian said, and uh, the discussion on the fora that's, uh, that you know discusses these issues and uh, takes it forward is really important because each of the uh, forums that we've mentioned here, whether it's UNESCO, or OECD, World Bank, or national governments, or the private sector, come at it with different perspectives. But these prob the issues and the, the technologies that we're discussing are so all-encompassing that we need all of these perspectives and to find some sort of ideal way to make it work. <laughs> I, um, thank you. I guess the core message of, of uh, the presentation I made is as we evolve into gigabit networks and 5G and, and the next evolution in general of communications infrastructure, the, we really have to go, it goes back to the basics. It exacerbates our traditional telecom issues, which are streamlining rights of way, efficient spectrum management, how to deploy more backhaul and backhaul, and how to have access of this wholesale facilities, and in general, power density regulations that might need to be thought of. Um, I guess my message is like we really need new frameworks for policy making to encourage international and diverse companies to be involved in the development and the deployment of new technologies. Well, thank you to all of our panelists. If I can ask you to join us, uh, a round of applause to our panelists. Marta, if you have any closing remarks, that's it. Okay, so thanks everyone. Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.